Rod Steiger's Legacy, Two Craggy Face Badasses, A Listener Request, and a John Hughes-inspired board game? And that's just for starters. Jason and I have conquered the kindred, and now we meander our way towards our next adventure. Welcome to the Yarn Wall, where all of our dreams become realities, and all realities slide into our nightmares. Cue the music. And in three, two, one, I already forgot it. You will be soon the speak of a giant, or I call the others. Dead. You think I imagined all of it, don't you? You think I'm insane? That's feng shui. A match made in a bathroom. Just floating into the void. Well, today might be a real loose episode. Oh, sure. We're talking about bran muffins and laxatives. Yeah, and, and real loose. Really, really strong black coffee. <laughs> oh, man, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. That's what this episode's going to be. Just have to take a shower afterwards <laughs> and try to forget about it. So, do we apologize now? Do we apologize at the end? We continue to apologize throughout the show. (laughs) Let us know if we've offended you. Yeah. We have yet to have really any emails saying that we've been offensive. And I'm thinking we need to turn it up a little bit because... Anything. I'll take anything at this point. (laughs) I just want to interact with some people, even if it is negative. (laughs) You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Um, we're just in a island of, we're adrift on the internet. Speaking of being adrift, uh, I was mm-hmm. looking at David Allen Brooks. We need to talk about a few people from the kindred, but okay, I did not bring up David Allen Brooks, the main guy, John Hollins. Well, he just seemed kind of a, yeah, like kind uh, of an empty suit kind of guy. Like yeah. he just was a guy, he was just some guy, you know? Everybody looked like him back then. Uh, he was uh, Dick Peterson in Castaway, so that was my <laughs> okay, that was my are... segue as a, a drift. <laughs> Both of his names <laughs> contain. Um, I mean, I don't want to be yeah, childish uh, about it, but Dick Peterson—that <laughs> is somebody's idea of a joke. I think that's third grade rules. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That kid would be mercilessly, uh, he would just be savaged in middle school. But uh, he was also in Manhunter. Yeah, I I almost queued that up just to see who he was. I think he's the guy that gets like fucking super glued to the uh, wheelchair and set on fire. He's like a journalist or something. Right? No, that was uh, Freddie Lowndes. Oh, okay. Leeds Lounge. I I saw an L name, and I. So I don't know who this guy is. So Stephen fucking Lang is Freddie Lounds. We've had this conversation before. But okay, it's just like, all right. It's just unbelievable. That is wild, wild, wacky stuff. I keep waiting here. It looks like uh, for Stephen Lang, there still is in post production. The Don't Breathe sequel, so... I knew that that was going to happen. Did you know the girlfriend in Manhunter is the girl from Brazil? I don't know her. It's Kim Greist? Greist? Yeah, Greist, Greist. Yeah, I primarily know her from Brazil. That's what I recognize her from. She's also in Throw Mama from the Train. Yeah, I see that. (laughs) So... Do with that what you will. Oh, she was in Chud, and... I was just watching a scene from that the other day and thought that she was uh, Virginia Madsen because she kind of looks like her a little bit. I mean, I was mistaken. Well, that's not even trivia. (laughs) (laughs) You can forget about that. All of this. That's what's good about our podcast, I think, is that it's disposable. You don't have to keep it in your head if you don't want to. You could be doing the most mundane tasks and... Cleaning a toilet, I think, would be probably. And we're probably entertaining enough to keep you motivated to clean that toilet. Yeah, really get in there. Use your your elbow grease. Go buy some elbow grease. Apply it. 
Oh my god! Now all I'm doing is just like scrolling through Manhunter. Yep. Like, man, Tom Noonan was so good in that. I had to get off of it because we could get stuck there for a while. Yep. Yep. I'm gonna close it out if you did too. I I recommend that. Dennis Farina. Yes. And Brian Cox as Hannibal Lecter. Well, man. Dennis Farina didn't he play Crawford? Yes. Yes. All right. Since we're on the subject, <laughs> damn it. I just said we weren't going to talk about it. We're not. We are still not going to talk about Manhunter. But. <laughs> we'll talk about everything. Let me talk about Manhunter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's fine. I love that movie. No, it's not necessarily about Manhunter. I've been watching the TV series Clarice. Okay. I've heard about this and I. I None of it's been good, I, I I hate to say. I hate to say that I'm not impressed. It's really lackluster. They really are playing up her being scarred mentally from right. uh, Jamie Gum. And that's the opposite of what happens in the novels, y- by yeah, the way. It- she becomes like a hardened, like angel of death kind of, you know. Yeah, I mean, she's having dreams of death heads, moths, and it doesn't play well. No. Because even my wife was like, well, did he didn't do anything to her, did he? He was like, no, he, he took a shot at her. <laughs> yeah. She killed him. Yeah, there's really no reason for her to be, like, haunted by that. I mean, really, she was only, well, I don't know. The show, does it happen immediately after the events of Silence uh, of the Lambs? Close a few years. Well, I'll, I just that's such a letdown from reading um, Hannibal. Yes, because it starts out with her just being a real badass. She b- drives this like fucking souped up uh, Mustang and, you know, it opens on like a raid on a house and mm-hmm. she's like fucking blowing people away. It all goes wrong. And, and she's the one that's kind of left like kind of holding the bag when she, really she was, you know, they make her out to be this like cold blooded killer. But it, the fact was they just didn't plan the, the raid very well. Anyway, it, she, I, her character is very interesting in the way she, um, evolves. Gotcha. Read it, read a book y'all. I, I haven't read it in a long time, but it's good. It's gross. But in this, it just, I don't know. It's just a run of the mill show. Really? Michael Cudlitz is in it. Uh, you'll know Michael Cudlitz. He was uh, he was in The Walking Dead. He was Abraham, but he was also in. Uh, oh, okay. He was Gross Point Blank. Uh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. He was the one that had to read the poem. That's his best role ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just shit faced drunk, and Martin's like trying not to like fucking kick his head off or something. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. watched a bunch of um, Benny. I. I, I Wish I had watched this before I started this podcast because I can't pronounce his last name, but uh, I just know him as Benny the Jet. He's the he's the assassin that keeps popping up in the you know right. everywhere. Right, they yeah. blow up the convenience store. And Urkides, Urkides, he has a Spanish last name and I can't pronounce it. But uh, he's got a bunch of fighting video. You know, he's like mm-hmm. a he's a martial artist and like a uh, you know billion times like. Golden Glove guy from back in the day, but uh, man, I've seen him in several things. But anyway, oh yeah, ahead, he ahead. he was in everything in the eighties. He was a big time stunt guy too. He's yeah, uh, Roadhouse. He was a fight trainer in Roadhouse, wow, Tango really? and Cash, um, Kickboxer Two, Gladiator, Digstown. Well, I didn't, I didn't look at any of that shit. We should be talking about this guy. Yeah, for sure. He did the fight training and then stunts and soldier. And he looks scary. <laughs> Why are we? I <laughs> uh, got on to gross oh, because point blank because of Michael Cudlitz. Cudlitz. I thought you were saying cutlets, like veal cutlets. Oh, it sounds delicious. But uh, he plays Paul Krendler and Clarice. Okay. Kendler's the bad guy, federal dude. Actually, he's the head of this VICAP unit. Oh, okay. But he doesn't trust Clarice, thinks she's a loose cannon, and hell, she's being haunted by her her dead father as well. She's still driving the Pinto. It's just, yeah. That is, well. I, I'm disappointed. Uh, it just, that depresses me. Hopefully they can pull it out. Uh, it does have Nick Sandow in it. 
Nick Sandow. Okay. Sandow. He was uh, Joe Caputo on uh, Orange is the New Black. The warden guy in Orange is the New okay, Black. Okay, with yeah. the big like shit kicker mustache. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like him. Yeah, I, I dig him. Yeah. Uh, it also has Cal Penn in it, uh, Harold and Kumar. Oh, right, right, right. He only does non- comedy roles now like every time i see him he is like stone-faced like i think he was just like man i'm gonna be a serious actor guys no more stoner flicks for me no nah, it's too bad that is too bad so anyway well um, guy so tim i think we're done with the episode rating for clarice zero i guess <laughs> yeah. tim hates it no i give it a 2.1 <laughs> okay what do you think about, uh, I'm just scrolling around, what do you think about uh, Queen Latifah being the new equalizer? Yeah. I'd watch it. I'd watch it if she really just beat the shit out of everybody with the crowbar. <laughs> Apparently she does, because I don't remember the old equalizer. Man, I used to know his name. Uh, Edward Woodward. Oh, man, good. How'd you How'd you do that? I've been waiting years for you to bring this up. <laughs> Finally, the <laughs> podcast is over. We've done it. Um, what'd you say his last name was? Edward Woodward. Woodward. I remember him for from a bunch of like, uh, oh, I don't know, like a bunch of movies on PBS, probably. Oh, duh. He's the, he's the cop from The Wicker Man. That's right. Okay. Nailed it. I remember him not so much beating people's asses as like... I don't know, like walking up behind them and like sticking them in the neck with a syringe or something. He was like <laughs> sneaky, but, but not like didn't know Kung Fu or anything. Edward Woodward was in uh, La Femme Nikita TV series, too. Oh, I only saw a few of those. Oh, he was in Hot Fuzz. <laughs> yeah. I love that movie. Fun freaking show. Anyway. Anywho. Let's get this episode started. We should. Welcome to the Yarn Wall. Welcome, guys, since we're already 20 minutes into it. I hope you enjoyed the show so far because the rest of it, like I said, may be downhill from here. Kind of like the uh, mining cart in uh, Temple of Doom. It's just yeah, barely, just... barely staying on the rails already. <laughs> and uh, I'm Tim Cornman. Hi. And with me, as always, is... I'm Jason Walker. Rickety Dickety. Rickety Mining Cart. <laughs> Jason Rickety Mining Cart Walker. Beautiful. Yeah, anyway, old British guys. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I brought up Clarice and had to, had to throw that at you early, because I do have a lot to talk about here. No, I wanted to know. It's going to seem like I'm all over the place, but I actually have some notes... I even had a couple of things written down of, hey, you should start off with this, Tim. This was mm -hmm. a funny joke. Wow. I have no idea what the joke was. <laughs> okay, good. Should have written down the joke. <laughs> right. I kind of have the same thing going on. I took a bunch of notes and then immediately threw them away. Well, you set them on fire. I mean, it's yeah, not like I you didn't can dig them out of the that. trash. They're like, they're ash now. <laughs> Well, I put my social security number on all of my, that's how I title all of my notes, so I can't just leave that around. Man, I just have to say, I'm still looking at Manhunter, and it's cool to look at the images because it's a Michael Mann movie, so everything looks fucking 80s and beautiful, you know? Mm hmm Did you know that Michael Mann, oh man, let me find it real quick edit my hesitation out because i should just be able to pop up with it but he did last of the mohicans did you know that i think we talked about that i can't even like square that in my mind because there's no like neon or like right. rainy streets <laughs> or you know what i mean same guy did collateral that did the last of the mohicans it's just kind of weird to me uh, we talked deep into Michael Mann when we were talking about the keep, so I oh, yeah, I'm sure we did. God, that wasn't that long ago, and I don't remember any of that. I have zero recall. I'm like the opposite of that movie with <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> zero recall. <laughs> He's like <laughs> I gotta tell you, I know you don't necessarily look at our Facebook group. I don't. Our group is growing. Wow. I'm inviting people into the group who have been befriending me. I've been getting a slew of friend requests. Okay. Uh, I'm sure two to three percent are actually real. Some of them are bots. 
But anybody who friends me, I've been throwing them straight into the moratorium group because I assume that that's what they want. They don't want me because I don't post on my normal stuff. Uh, I, I only know. post for this podcast. That's something that I wouldn't assume. You know what I mean? Because people are weird. You know what I mean? Like they would follow us just for one thing. They're like Alan Fudge devotees or something. And then we <laughs> trash him and they're like, this isn't the content that I. This isn't what I signed up for. I wanted a pro fudge forum and, and you guys are <laughs> shitting all over him. But I'm serious. People are like that, you know? Well, I've been getting a lot of direct messages too uh -oh. that I, I do not respond to the direct messages mm -hmm. but somebody in our facebook group uh messaged me said hello beautiful i love your <laughs> profile picture i'll be happy if you text me back okay. i'm a sugar daddy and i'm interested in having you as my sugar baby oh my god and you get paid weekly my payments start from five thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> so you <If> immediately <laughs> you're like where's my wallet yeah. oh thank god chrome saves all of my uh, credit card <laughs> numbers right. because i am two clicks away from this immediately when i was trying to delete this direct message uh -huh. i hit video call <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay so you're taking it up and you're like <laughs> like, I want to know more about this. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta see this guy or girl. <laughs> oh, it's a guy, and it's, it's. I know it's a hacked account, and it's an old guy. He thought you were beautiful, though. His message is at three oh five. At three oh seven, it says he missed your call. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He should be by the phone. <laughs> I laughed so damn hard because <laughs> I made myself a meme on accident. <laughs> yeah, you did. You're like, uh, I hope that Nigerian prince uh, is able to uh, <laughs> get back to. Oh, but that that was good stuff. I laughed awesome. for a good twenty minutes. Yeah. Awesome. So if there are any real sugar daddies out there, I'm just saying I'm available. Yeah. Maybe he's the heir to the, um, what's the name of that sugar company? The only one that there uh, is. C&H? Yeah, C&H. <laughs> yep. Yep. He's literally a sugar daddy. I don't want to break your heart, but I got the same message. Did uh, you? He thought I was beautiful too. Yes. Hey. Which I we probably should say your profile picture is just a ventriloquist doll's head. Yeah. So, yeah. so he thought that he thought that was beautiful. <laughs> Fetishes for everyone. I guess that's the point I was trying to make earlier is like people get into some weird, mm -hmm. very specific stuff. Mm -hmm. Which makes us want to up, up our uh, OnlyFans. <laughs> Contribute. Or, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, we can make some no. stuff happen. We can make the magic happen <laughs> for just $5 a month. Don't you think that sounds okay? Nah, I think we could up that. Okay, well. I know that there has to be a a fetish out there for somebody who's looking for a middle-aged, overweight man who does a podcast. It's got to be out there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There's some, They say there's somebody for everybody. That's right. So let's break in here and talk about Rod Steiger, because we oh failed to go I... down Rod Steiger's career from the Kindred, and yep. you said that you had found some interesting stuff. I wanted you to share some shit with us. He's like the last generation's Kevin Bacon. Like, playing the Kevin Bacon game with him would be uh, super easy. Okay. He trained with, like, you know, Uta Hagen and, like... Uh, Who? You know, he was like super method, worked with Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading some Mar Marlon Brando shit earlier, and oh maybe God, that was a dude. mistake. I understand that he was great, and I mean, he was in fucking The Godfather, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but he like really dropped off. And his Jabba years? <laughs> yeah, yes. I do not think of Streetcar Named Desire or you know, any of his like classic movies. When I think of him, I think of Island of Dr. Moreau and him having that little like um, metal fez that you put 
mm-hmm. ice in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you remember that part? He he had ice on his head. Mm-hmm. Just a like nexus of the worst decisions ever. You know, <laughs> let's have Val Kilmer and Marlon Brando. I mean, I think Val Kilmer was a very you know, he got real weird, too, before he got, like, throat cancer or whatever. Mm. But, uh, God, having to fucking wrangle those two dudes yeah. all, all In- day. Insane. And they were, like, fighting at, at the same time, you know? So when they had to be on screen together, it was a big fucking thing. And, I mean, if you look at Rod Steiger's IMDb, he was... I think he... On the Waterfront is the movie that he was in with uh, Marlon Brando. Yes, Directed by Elia Kazan. And you weren't lying here. It actually says in his trivia, talks about him being the Kevin Bacon, is listed as the center of the Hollywood universe by the University of Virginia's Oracle of Kevin Bacon. They have an Oracle of Kevin Bacon. (laughs) What do you mean? Do they have like a... I don't know. It's a shrine. Like a blind girl that's just has like a robe and in a cave. <laughs> that's what I think of as an oracle. <laughs> I could be wrong. But it says that uh, Rod Steiger can be linked to any other movie actor in the classic Kevin Bacon game style in an average of 2.651 steps. I I mean, I believe it because I just, uh, using him, I have lost, somebody's coming in here and taking my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I've reached that age where. It has to be somebody else. It's uh, somebody, a gremlin. <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me, somebody you, who you, just brings their gremlin over to your house. Yes. Get that gremlin out of here. What are you thinking? My dog's going to just sit and bark at it the whole time. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Sorry. Yeah, I used Rod Steiger to, uh, of course, get out of uh, the Kindred. And okay. that's why I started looking at that stuff, because I was like, okay, I feel like we're not... I mean, we never call it the Kevin Bacon game, but that's what we're playing, you know, when we do right. the Yarnwall. So, uh, but for us... I really think it would be more fitting to have uh, one of these other people that uh, just keeps on showing up. But um, but I, I'll get into that when I do my movie later. So, But yeah, anyway, I believe he was uh, nominated for a couple of uh, Academy Awards. I don't know if he won. Okay. I think he does have an Oscar, right? or Rod Steiger does, but I'm trying to find it. So what you're saying, though, is that you went through Rod Steiger, and which means the yarn could go absolutely anywhere. Yes, basically. There's no way that I can guess it now because I would be wrong. I know you definitely wouldn't get it. Uh, just you'd, you'd have to put some time into it but uh it was one of those things where i just felt like you know i had several movies to pick from still have like you know a hundred but uh this one just happened so easily that i was like oh well it was meant to be you know but what's funny is i don't think we want rod steiger as because i wanted to make whoever it is whoever we decide on you know seven Mm -hmm. degrees of alan fudge or whatever Uh, it shouldn't be rod steiger and I'll, I, I'm going to reveal my candidate later, but uh, I think you'll I think you'll approve. So what else you got on this beefy, bald headed guy? All of these guys that we look at that were born in the you know early 1900s, uh, they all uh, were in the military. Um, they all had like kind of hard scrabble lives, you know. And um, Rod Steiger is no different. He joined a acting group uh, with. The GI Bill paid for it, okay. and that was his uh, ticket into Hollywood. So his the first thing on his trivia says he was offered the title role in Patton. Yeah, right. But refused the role, saying, I'm not going to glorify war. Right. Which the role went to George C. Scott, who won yeah. the Oscar for the for the role. Right. Steiger calls his refusal the dumbest career move. And he has a lot of uh, parallels with uh, George C. Scott. They kind of, you know, audition for a lot of the same roles. 
I think he was nominated for um, Best Actor for The Pawnbroker, which I think I've actually seen. Couldn't tell you a thing about it, but I, I, I have an image of him in it. Uh, he landed what many consider as his greatest role, Sheriff Bill Gillespie in The Heat mm-hmm. of the Night, 1967, yeah. opposite Sidney Poitier. Steiger deservedly took home the Best Actor Oscar for the work in that film. Okay, gotcha. And it, this is saying that Pawnbroker is his second Oscar nomination. So I don't, but I, he was the main character, so I assume it's for Best Actor. I guess so. That was 1964. Rod Steiger is the pawnbroker. Hot pawnbroking action. Oh, my God. Is it just like a film of him just like selling guns to? I think so. It says a Jewish pawnbroker, victim of Nazi persecution, loses all faith in his fellow man until he realizes too late the tragedy of his actions. It always turns into a comedy. <laughs> well, it's from Sidney Lumet. What do you expect? He's known for uh, all the yeah. comedies like uh, 12 Angry Men, yeah. Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. 12 Angry Men was just silly. I like watching that <laughs> when it's, you know, I just want something silly to watch. Sidney is also, uh, he's credited with uh, Serpico, Ooh. The Wiz, what? <laughs> Death Trap. Oh, my God. You just named three movies that were on HBO when I was a kid that I have seen one million times. Oh, my God, dude. Death Trap? I've never seen it. Are you kidding me? I've never seen it. Do you already know, like, kind of the... The box art is iconic. I mean, it's a Rubik's Cube that has... Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Michael Caine and Christopher Reeve and Diane Cannon sticking their heads out of... Don't read anything about it. You've got to see it. I can't believe. There's just a one-line synopsis on IMDb here. So it says, a Broadway playwright puts murder in his plan to take credit for a student's play. That tells me a lot of nothing. It's a real, like, um, Jay Davidson's wiener. Or, what's his name? Jay (laughs) Davidson? Is that his name from Stargate? Yes. yes. Uh Uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> Why didn't he show his wiener in Stargate? You know, like a deleted scene. Right. He just shows it to Kurt Russell real quick. I call this Little Raw. Mm-hmm. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> he just punches him in the face. Kurt Russell's hair in that movie is hilarious in Stargate. Uh-huh. They, like, cut it with a level. Like, you could <laughs> set a beer on top of it, and it would not move. Um... Where are we? <laughs> oh, we were talking about Rod the Bod Steiger. Rod the Bod. But see, that's what I'm saying is like, I, it makes me think that that kind of method acting that he must do, you know, that Marlon Brando kind of got into. I wonder if those guys just get so far into their heads that it makes them kind of crazy. Because Rod yeah. Steiger in The Kindred, I mean, I know he's acting, but something seems wrong with him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think he reached that part of his career where he was just like being really taking weird, um, like idiosyncratic decisions, you know, in their acting real weird. Well, in his trademarks on IMDb states his chunky frame (laughs) and serious looking face. Okay. I guess I agree with that. Yeah. Full bodied, somewhat bombastic style of acting. That sounded like you were describing a wine for a second. I know. Oh, it's full body, <laughs> aromatic, bombastic <laughs> acting style. Notes of leather and <laughs> antifreeze. <laughs> they say the weirdest things when they're doing those like professional, like, uh, who? what is it? A sommelier? Is that who? Mm-hmm. There's a gentle hint of, you know, pencil lead and, you know, it's like, well, what? when have you ever I just sucked on a pencil lead? I feel like I could be a sommelier. Have there ever been sommelier pirates? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. They just like uh, hijack big wine shipments. <laughs> anyway, uh, Rod Steiger was married five times. Ooh, see, that's another red flag I'm thinking. Mm hmm. He seems like he would be the kind, Marlon Brando does too, where they'd have like secret 
families that nobody else knew about, you know, oh. they just leave for years and then. I am positive you are correct there. Who is he married to? Uh, a lot of people. People I don't know. People that are probably long dead. Sorry, mm-hmm. guys, but it happens. Well, I can't look at his face, frankly, anymore. Nope. Uh, yep. I'm just going to hard click. <laughs> click off of that. Go and click off of that. I'm going to close Michael Mann while I'm at it, too. All right. Yep, 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 yep. I got Molly Ringwald open for some reason. This week at work, I've been kind of like just not into it. So I've just been kind of like doodling all the time. And uh, I was thinking about the Brat Pack as I am wont to do. And um, I guess just trying to kind of nail down exactly who that is, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically just the cast of The Breakfast Club, you know? Right. With uh, some other John Hughes kind of like satellite uh, people, you know, like Eric Stoltz and, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, those type of, you know, they're like the second tier uh, Brat Pack guys. But um, like I said, I'm just doodling at work. So I kind of came up with sort of a Candyland style board game to play with some of the uh, <laughs> with some of the Brat Pack people. You know, since I can't see you rolling some dice or something, you know, and I, I don't really trust you either. Oh, uh, <laughs> to say, oh, I rolled six again. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, no, you didn't. Stop using that D20, Tim. Exactly. <laughs> you <can't>. This is <laughs> this is not D&D. I have slayed the candy cane forest. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's stuck in molasses swamp for a little bit. <laughs> Some of the things that I kind of had jotted down for uh, different, I guess these are probably all, uh, you know, you don't want to land on these spaces in the uh, Brat Pack Candyland. I'll come up with a better name for it. Have you made little cardboard cutouts of each Brat Pack character that you can play? Not yet, but let me tell you something, and this is not, I am not lying. I have Photoshop up right now with a picture of the Breakfast Club. Uh, sitting on that rail in the library. Have you cropped my face over Molly Ringwald's body? Not yet. Uh, But (laughs) Molly Ringwald's face is not there anymore. (laughs) The way her head is turned in the picture that I have, it just really lends itself to uh, some good uh, head swaps. And I'll maybe this will kind of lead into, um, you know, usually we wait uh, till a little later for the uh, movie reveal. So, Mm -hmm. Okay, it'll come back up. I was just going to read some of the, uh, you know, maybe some of the obstacles in uh, Candyland or uh, Brat Pack (laughs) Candyland. Let's see. You can land in uh, Candyland detention, obviously. You mess with the bull. Now you get the horns. Now Mm -hmm. you're just there with the... For 10 weeks. For 10 weeks. 10 (laughs) weeks. He has you for 10 weeks. (laughs) Principal Vernon does. Let's see. I have, uh, oh, Christmas at the Benders, where um, okay, you, right. uh, Dad just got a new carton of hey, cigarettes. Hey, smoke up, Johnny. <laughs> He's going to put some out on your arms. So uh, That's right. This is what you get when you spill paint in the garage. Did I stutter? <laughs> so landing on that space <laughs> probably wouldn't be a good idea. There should be three spaces of the same thing. Right. One of them just says, did I stutter? Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> in fact, there's not very many spaces in this game that are just good. You know, you're not making progress. You're you're pretty much yes. going to get uh, get the business. You're going to get hosed. I have like a St. Elmo's fire trap or something. Uh, <laughs> Great. And of course, John Parr's immortal classic, Man Where in Motion. you have to sing the entire song before you can get off that space. Yeah, it is playing constantly while you're on that space. <laughs> this is going to be a complicated game. I'm going to need um, to do a Kickstarter, <laughs> like a GoFundMe or something. All right. But anyway, so that's what I've been doing. I'm just kind of... <laughs> Not really related to the podcast. No, 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 doing God, this no. Thing. <laughs> See, and I kind of thought about like uh, doing kind of a D and D or maybe like a Magic the Gathering because I have Ali Sheedy's dandruff as like a weapon. Oh, um, okay. Also, Robert Downey Jr. could do the same thing. He kind of throws cocaine in your face and then scampers off. 
<laughs> I have good, lose a turn good. for that one. I like it. All right. And Charlie Sheen's strip club. But anyway, you get the idea. You got to practice for your scholarship. <laughs> I was just thinking about the lipstick scene and uh, uh-huh. who would be a good uh, replacement for Molly Ringwald. I'll give you a hint. It's an old guy that was born in 1920, but. Uh, Rod Steiger. No, nope, <laughs> but real close. <laughs> real <Right>. close. <laughs> Hey, uh, can we take a break real quick? Sure. And then we can actually get started with the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. You're going to hear some screaming, and um, I think Joey Bishop gets shot. No, not Joey Bishop. Uh, Peter Lawford. Well, there's always an MST playing in the background, whether you have the sound on or That's off. Very true. So, which one is it this time? It's uh, Angel's Revenge, a uh, Charlie's Angels ripoff from the 70s. All right. Uh, and you know what's funny? It's directed by Great On Clark. Yes. And his wife is the main character. Mm hmm. Oh, Great Don. What won't you do? <laughs> I hate him. I hate him with a passion. I need to back up a minute because I did have a small tangent I wanted to take us okay. down uh, from David Allen Brooks. Every time you say that, I think you're going to say David Allen Greer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. You get excited for a brief moment. I like, oh. do. But uh, I was looking at his career earlier today, and uh, he was in a movie called. Movie. Movie called Scream for Help. This was in 1984. That does not sound exciting at all. <laughs> no. A teenage girl discovers that her stepfather is trying to murder her and her mother. But when she tells people, no one will believe her. And I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's just a, I didn't watch the trailer for it, but it looks like a little, just a little slasher film, you know, that has really nobody in it. But it was written by Tom Holland. Oh, weird. Yeah. I'm trying to find it. What's it called again? Oh my gosh. I got to back up. Scream for help. Okay. 1984. Got it, got it. So I got me looking at, you know, Tom Holland for a minute, because we've talked mm-hmm. about him being the writer of Fright Night, Child's yep. Play, and he's been love around for quite a while. We love him. That movie, Scream for Help, uh, was directed by Michael Winner. Yes. And okay. Michael Winner did The Sentinel, Death Wish. Uh, he did a bunch of uh, like action I movies and now, stuff yeah. like that. Serpico, The Mechanic. Man, he played around with that a lot, yeah. He did so many Charles Bronson films, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Chato's Land. I've never seen Mr. Majestic. I, I think I get that and uh, the mechanic mixed up. You know what we got here? Motherfucking Charlie Bronson. <laughs> Mr. Majestic. Mm-hmm. He also directed a movie called Dirty Weekend. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Is it like a uh, they work on like a sod farm or something? <laughs> it actually has David McCallum in it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Very interesting. Since we just brought him up, this is the story of Bella who woke up one morning and realized she'd had enough. Ooh. All it took was one rather nasty man to transform her from a meek and mild secretary into a murderous. Femme fatale. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Run DMC when you were kind of struggling for <laughs> Which would have made a much better movie. Yes, I think so. Whenever you need somebody, uh, just a British guy, to really... David McCallum is good to just plop in there. Mm-hmm. He did additional voices on Diablo 3, Reaper of Souls. That is incredible. Okay. One of these days, not today, but we we're going to have to talk about David McCallum's voiceover work, mm-hmm. which I did not know was a thing. It goes on and on and on. Holy shit. Oh, That's yeah. crazy. I started looking at him last time we were talking about him. I'm like, ugh. That market. wild. We are going to have to spend an hour on that. But David Allen Brooks was also in a TV series. He was in one episode of a TV series called She-Wolf of London. <laughs> yes, I saw that. 
It's created by Mick Garris and Tom McLaughlin. I think I looked that up one time. And it reads, a female American graduate student in London is bitten by a werewolf, then teams up with an English professor to investigate supernatural occurrences. It's <laughs> It sounds hilarious. Uh, I think there's just 20 episodes. Uh, but Tom McLaughlin, who helped create this, mm -hmm. he wrote and directed Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Oh, God. But he also wrote Date with an Angel. So where did that be? <laughs> Yet another one that I just remember from my childhood as being like, I mean, it was on TV. Mm hmm constantly david dukes from a rawhead rex is in that I, he doesn't have a ton of credits but when i see him i'm like i see you buddy but uh, tom mclaughlin also wrote and directed a movie called one dark night okay and this reads as a part of initiation into a club called the sisters a young girl must spend the night in a mausoleum i'm like all right all right dot it's dot dot Meg Tilly. Mm. I'm like, hmm. I love a good Meg Tilly movie. And Kevin Peter Hall. The guy that played the Predator? Exactly. <laughs> that guy. Um, you know what is wild about Scream for Help? I'm sorry, I'm still on that. Mm -hmm. You know when you hover <laughs> over the uh, like trailer next to it? Mm -hmm. It has sex in the trailer. Oh, awesome. Like, David Allen Brooks, or Dab, as I call him, um, walks into a room and his girlfriend's like, his friend's like fucking his girlfriend. Oh, wow. That's All in right. the trailer. Anyway. anyway. Well, did you see, did you look at the images for She-Wolf of London? It looks awful. It looks horrible. I mean, it looks like they're just doing Tales from the Dark Side, basically. Yep. But the guy turning into the weird, like... Mouse uh, or rat? Mm -hmm. He's got the rat whiskers. Yep. I big do butt not teeth. like that at all. So, which is going to take me straight into part of my... Am I going to call this the Goratorium? Yes, this is my Goratorium entry. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go straight into it from this because it kind of really fits. Can I say one thing really uh, quick? I suppose... I just want to say that in Date with an Angel, um, <laughs> Michael E. Knight, who was, I remember him from a lot of different stuff, too, uh, from back in the day. But uh, his girlfriend is Phoebe Cates, right? Awesome. Yes. Uh, the most, like, beautiful girl ever. Although in this, you know, this is like mid-80s. She has a, like, boy's haircut, kind of. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean. Yeah, it was Drop Dead Fred time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just one of those things where the angel is just like a skinny blonde chick and his girlfriend is Phoebe Cates. And it's like, I think I would just call the police and let them handle it and I'll just stay here with Phoebe Cates. But anyway, that's just my personal. Oh, B.B. Besh is in that, too. I saw okay. that. Yes. Clicking off of it now. All right. Clicking off now. All right. Well, I'm going to go straight into this idea. Uh, because we just talked kind of like the, the equalizer, you know, uh, I was just thinking about TV series. Okay. Okay. And we have a lot of TV series that were kind of based on horror and mystery and stuff like that. But there was a certain kind of genre back in the eighties where we had a drifter that was involved. Mm hmm. Right. The hitchhiker. It, I mean, the hitchhiker is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was trying to beat around the bush, but you didn't I know, let me. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Straight to the hitchhiker. Do you remember this show? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you watch it? Yeah. It's no Tales from the Dark Side or, you know, Tales from the Crypt. It must not have been very memorable because I can't even, like, come up with one plot. Hmm. Every one of them, it looks like they're on YouTube. And that's oh, really okay, the cool. only place you can find it uh, without paying. Right. Anyway. And it's a, I guess we should say it's like, it's an anthology that's like strung together with, with, uh, I don't know what you call that. Like, uh, I thought maybe that the hitchhiker was a part of the stories, but no, he's just kind of the intro. He's what yes. ties it together. He's, but he's not in any of the episodes. Is that correct? Right. I'm just now getting it up here. Okay. It started in 1983. Mm -hmm. I thought that I would recognize the hitchhiker. Nope. Um, 
I kind of thought that he was a better known actor. I do not recognize him at all. Nope. Uh, I his do name's not. Paige Fletcher. Yeah, and every time I see his name, I keep trying to say Felcher. Oh, man, that's something completely different. <laughs> the series had a lot of well-known actors in it, too. Yeah. Um, Kirstie Alley was in two episodes. Oh, Shannon God. Tweed was in two episodes. Sure. Your Gary Buseys, your Tom Scarrett's. <laughs> I am sure it just goes on. On and you are on and you on. are not. It looks like you're just scrolling through every actor that was available in 1983, yeah. basically. Yes, Helen Hunt, Kelly Lynch, James Remar. But I remember this show on HBO, and I think at the time, and now granted, this was like 1983 when it started. I was 11. I, my dad was taking me to go see like the entity at the movie theater, sure. but I wasn't necessarily allowed to watch this show. Not at home. Right. It, it, <laughs> it was taboo. And I remember it being kind of taboo. Well, I watched the first episode and I wanted to watch more, but I had to get tied up in other things for this podcast. Oh, yeah. You're into that autoerotic asphyxiation stuff. <laughs> but. This is like Zalman King did Creep Show. Right. Yep. They're just little montage stories. Yep. Little vignettes. But there was a lot of nudity in the first episode that I, I watched it with my wife. God. And she's like, um, is this a porno? <laughs> this girl's got her tits out. And I'm like, why? Are you getting tingly? And you like it? You like that? Then she threw a shoe at me. Yeah, that seems right. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this is at the same time as like Dream On. I remember watching mm. Dream On with like my mom and it was like, oh, yeah, awkward because everybody's nude in that. Movie, yeah. During that show. The story was interesting. The first story just basically is um, a young, virile looking man getting ready to get married to um, a rich, older lady and. It's basically he falls in love with uh, with her like niece or her stepdaughter or whatever. So I don't whoever it is. It's OK. There. And so he's trying to get out of his marriage. Anyway, lots of sex, a lot of nudity, little twist, couple of deaths. Kind of interesting. <laughs> OK. I will continue to go down. I'll give you a hitchhiker update as I continue to watch this. Yeah, great. I mean, is it time for another series to come out where you have a drifter? And I'm not just talking about the highway to heaven drifter. <laughs> yeah. Drifters really have a negative uh, connotation. <laughs> right. But when we talked about before, we talked about then came Bronson. This is kind mm -hmm. of the same idea. Well, and also like Incredible Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, and the master too, for that matter. I mean, we knew we were going to bring it up at some point, but... Um... <laughs> Or like Kung Fu, I guess, you know, just kind right. of a wanderer that like every episode is something different. But this one was different because the wanderer in the story is not in the story. Correct. He's just the host. I do like that image, you know, but yeah, he kind of serves no purpose. Did you see that originally, I think, like probably for the pilot and a couple of episodes, Nicholas Campbell was the hitchhiker? Uh, before oh, yes, it was yes. this other guy, you know, he's the serial killer from uh, Dead Zone and. Oh, right. OK, in, yeah. He, Frank. He's Dodd. been in a ton of stuff. I watched that episode again. Uh, well, not episode that scene. I've mm -hmm. seen the several times scene. lately. The scissor scene. Yes. Yeah. Do you know the kind of like I don't I've probably brought it up before, but like the Stephen King lore behind uh, Dead Zone or at least his character. I think you, you went in to tell me about this before. I think I probably shut myself down right after I said it because there is literally no... There's no evidence? I had no follow-up to it. It did happen during the time when he is, you know, killing people. He is, like, inhabited by the spirit of the thing that was in Cujo. If you can, if you can imagine that when Cujo died, uh, his whatever that thing, kind of a Chucky situation where it just mm -hmm. floated around and found uh, Frank Dodd. 
I thought it was kind of the other way around that Frank Dodd was oh, the evil that I'm sorry. went into Cujo. You're that... absolutely right. Take okay. that, flip it. Yes, yes. Okay. That seems less <laughs> silly. Is that just in the books that mentions that, or does it? I think Stephen King gives it like two sentences. <laughs> that's okay. It. I don't think he really cared either. Man, I hope I'm right about that too, because I'm just, that is just something I have not verified to myself. It's just a memory that I have. Well, that is a call out to our listeners. Please. Yeah. Pipe in, man. Tell Please. us. Please. Set Stephen us straight. King fans, let's chat. We have so many things we're looking at here. It's hard to keep this episode together, let alone it, the tangents really that we just happen upon. It really is. I get the weirdest sense of like synchronicity plus like deja vu when I'm just sitting here scrolling through IMDb. <laughs> it's very weird. This looks just like last week when we did the podcast. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe I I'm, I'm, I just have a recovered memory from seven days ago. Since we bring up uh, Stephen King, huh? and we talked about it just recently that that Todd sent us both a link to watch the short film of One for the Road. Oh my gosh, I can't! I haven't watched it yet. Damn it! That's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> oh man, it does look like it was filmed with an iPhone. Yeah, uh, it does seem like half of the voices are dubbed in. And severely bad um, impersonations of... Like Northerners or something? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm, people from Maine? Yeah, go ahead and, and pull out your uh, Judd from Pet Cemetery. <laughs> I don't really have one. Uh, I really don't have a, a, North, a Northern accent. But it seems like everybody's trying to do this accent, and it's just butchered. Oh, and, I got one. It's okay. pretty easy to do. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Remember that old <laughs> commercial? <laughs> That's the only one I have. Do you remember when Pepperidge Farm. Gage walked out into the road and got hit by yeah. that there semi -truck? It wasn't a car. Well, Pepperidge Farm remembers. <laughs> Could have been a car. I think that's just all you have to do is just have like open-ended like lots of A's <laughs> and everything with an A if you can. So anyway, I'm just uh, I'm gonna induct uh, the hitchhiker into the okay. oratorium. I will be Great. revisiting this series since there are 85 episodes, and I did not watch 85 episodes to go into this show. Oh no no! Uh, but I will continue, and I will give you a hitchhiker update as we go along. Great. I thought about doing that with like, a, you know, maybe we can keep this going. I mean, there's so many episodes of that. Like when you get bored with it, then we'll just stop doing it. All I'm saying is you're probably going to have to not in chronological order, I guess oh, is right. what I'm saying. Like pick the good ones, you know. It, somebody please give me a list of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, there might be few and far between. I thought about like uh, Friday the 13th, the series too. Yes. You know? Uh, that would be a good one just to kind of pop in every once in a while and see what's going on. I think you're right. Um, somebody on Twitter posted a picture recently uh, that they were in like a CVS or like a Walgreens and the DVD counter had the entire series <laughs> like on clearance for seven dollars. Uh, but it was like those old like clamshell of awesome. Friday the 13th. The series. The series. I have got to find that. That yeah. would be awesome. I remember that show being pretty cool. I watched it, and I want to say that I watched it religiously, but I don't remember anything. It is more of a... it The, the kind of wraparound... Boy, I'm really going to have to work on my like terminology. What I'm trying to say is there are two character i mean it's almost like an x files where each episode is a different uh thing but the uh it has two lead characters that kind of um hold it all together right okay and are they anybody louise roby mm, which nope. i've kind of recognized her face and chris wiggins is the other um wiggity wig wiggins wiggity whack wiggins is what they called him 
So there were 72 episodes of Friday the 13th series. So it's about the same amount of time. Okay. Wow, that's a lot. These definitely have a lot of monsters in them. And I think that's probably what kind of disappointed me about The Hitchhiker is uh, I don't think very often is it supernatural, is it? It's more like of a thriller. I think it does have the supernatural aspects. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did I not read it off at all? I'm the horrible host. It says each story is usually a mysterious thriller. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it does say that right in the... Usually. <laughs> in fact, that's the only thing it says. Fictional <laughs> stories are told in this television series by the Hitchhiker. Each story is usually a mystery thriller or a mysterious mm. thriller. It says he tells the story. Well, he introduces it, the, the story. The Hitchhiker doesn't speak, does he? He usually stops and talks to the camera. Well, I say that. He did in the first oh, episode. okay. But this episode, uh, so the grandmother of the kid gives him this little statuette of a man and a wife, you know, to put on the cake of, of when he's getting married, right? Okay. She talks about the bond. I mean, this represents the bond between husband and wife, and this will be everlasting bond. Like gold bond medicated powder. <laughs> so, so somebody puts this cake topper on there, but then they put candles around it. How often do you see candles on a wedding cake? <laughs> well, if it's a kind of joint uh, wedding slash birthday. So they lit the candles, then the millionaires uh -huh. and her boy toy that had just gotten married, both of them start having trouble breathing because whoever broke... You know, lit the candles, yeah. it's taken away their air. So they're just like, uh. <laughs> Later, uh, the kid was like messing with the the little statuette and he was trying uh -huh. to separate the man from the woman. And for some reason, because he thought he had an idea that this was happening and he cut his wrist uh, by cutting the wrist of the statuette. So he has this idea that, hey, he can probably kill off his new wife to be with her freaking stepdaughter and get away with it. So he talks to the, I guess there's a live in doctor that lives with him. And he's like, hey, doc, let's go scuba diving later. He talks the, uh, the stepdaughter into putting a glass globe over the statuette to cut off the oxygen. Right. It's a voodoo doll. Yes. So while he has his oxygen coming from his tank while they're scuba diving and then has his own alibi. So after the wife is dead and the kids getting with the daughter-in-law mm -hmm. and they're having sex mm -hmm. again, there's a bird that keeps they keep showing this close up on this bird. Okay in a cage and it gets out of the cage and it for some reason starts attacking this statuette which then pokes the guy's eyes out <laughs> scratches him up and he's just got blood running down his face and he's just like oh my god and stumbles out the freaking balcony <laughs> <laughs> classic and then falls down some stairs and shatters just as the actual statuette shatters when the bird knocks he over. shatters yes he shattered that's different yes um i love a good railing kill but uh <laughs> that sounds <laughs> it sounds awful it was all right it was all right there was enough boobs yeah and that laughable ending yeah you're watching it semi ironically yes <laughs> semi you know, something else. Too. <laughs> Sexy. There's 98 images for the Hitchhiker on IMDb, and every mm -hmm. single one is like, what? What? I mean, like, <laughs> literally, I, like, they are trying to cram so many, like, and all these people are like future stars, you know, mm -hmm. or already stars, I <laughs> guess. God, dude, there was a time when Barry Bostwick's hair, they had to probably do like a wide angle <laughs> lens because it is brushing the acoustic tiles. That's awesome. Gene Simmons is in one, just being Gene Simmons. Michael O'Keefe, of course, from Whoopi Boys. We know him primarily from that. Mm -hmm. 
So picture 98 or sorry, 94 of 98 is the, the episode I was talking about the original first okay. episode shattered vows. You get a picture of the, the little statuette man and wife. That's such a weird. Now, did they, did they do something to piss off this woman or why, what did she get out of it? I'm, I'm, I forget. You forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in my head, I just kind of yada, yada, yada through the story. And so the guy is just now falling in love with the stepdaughter and they are trying to kill off the heiress so they can get the money and okay. go run off together. Okay. Your classic, uh, love, not love story. Yeah. What could go wrong? Basically. Uh, just to give our audience a little idea of who is actually in these episodes. Oh God. Karen Black, Kirstie Alley, Alan Thicke. Um, Bill Paxton, yeah, I saw Brad Dourif, Brian James, C. Thomas Howell, Chris Makepeace, David Dukes. Do you think the one with C. Thomas Howell was like, if he sees a hitchhiker, he's gonna go for him? Ooh. You know? Oh, yeah. The hitchhiker versus the hitcher. That's <laughs> yes, better. exactly. And and what is the difference between the two? <laughs> Very interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. I will be spending some time on this. All right. And I'm going to watch all the old dream ons and I will, we'll just do a uh, drinking game out of it. All like right. how many tits there are. We'll just, <laughs> I don't drink, but I'll do virgin jello shots <laughs> Great. every time we see that. Just a jello cup, man. Yep. All right. So that is going to be the, uh, the end of my induction into this week's Goratorium. Gosh, that just made me so like, I love those anthology things when they're done correctly. Everything is so fuzzy back then. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the quality. I think it's a choice that they made where everything's kind of like, you know, kind of soft edges around everything, sort of like just semi soft core. Does it get you a kind of dreamy feel? Yeah, I guess maybe that's what it's trying to do is look like kind of like uh, I think they did that in like the later like Nightmare on Elm Streets, like to differentiate between like what the dream was. And gotcha. I could be You're wrong, right. though. No, I don't think you are. All right. Well, who do you have today for uh, your deep dive? Well, usually how I, I combine the uh, my yarn wall with the uh, deep dive. Do you want to weave him into your yarn or do you yeah, want to? Let's let's go ahead and because uh, you have a deep dive, too, correct? I have a deep dive and I have our listener request. OK, you do your deep dive, then I'll okay. do my guy and then we'll do the, the request and the movie. OK. OK, so you go first. All right. This guy I just happened upon. Uh, and he's somebody that's been around for a while and I, I just, he's not a name that actually stands out. Maybe it's because his name is so, it's like a common name. Okay. Like Joe Smith. No. How about William Smith? Uh, Will Smith? <laughs> We're doing Will Smith? <laughs> nope. William Smith. This William Smith, uh, six foot two, born in 1933. Oh. His nickname, Big Bill. Yep. He was uh, in Every Which Way You Can. Yep. Any Which Way You I'm Can. I'm looking at it right now. He was the boxer dude that was going up against Clint Eastwood right. in Any Which Way You Can. Great. So he played Loving. Jack Wilson. Oh, man. He's been around forever. I didn't recognize him right off, but once you start thinking of his face, oh. you can picture him in all sorts of shit. For sure. He's got 275 credits. Wow. Now, is he another stuntman turned actor or what do we got? Yes and yes. It looks like a stunt. It, you could grate cheese with his face. I mean, he has a very <laughs> craggy. Uh, he has 30 credits in the stunts department. Yeah. Which uh, goes down to he was a stunt double and Female Friends in 1958. Wow. Okay. What would that movie be about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's also very, I mean, he got craggier and craggier as time went mm -hmm. on. Kind of like Scott Glenn. He's actually a really good looking guy. I think that like his roles 
turned him into like this like leathery kind of uh mm-hmm. he looked like a leading man to begin with and now he is like uh become the the villain kind of and since you brought it up since i was going to bring it up Sorry. you all it's like you're you're reading my mind <laughs> We're literally on the same page, <laughs> the IMDb page. Because of Scott Glenn was another reason I brought this guy up. Okay. Because he has a bit in his trivia that just seems outlandishly <laughs> Can't <believe> strange. It. <laughs> okay. It says he performed over 5,100 continuous sit-ups over a five hour period. What? <laughs> he does like stupid human tricks too? Yes. So oh. Scott Glenn did 2,000 push ups. Oh, right, <laughs> William dude. Smith did 5,100 sit ups. Those guys need to get together. Between them, they've got <laughs> a fucking ripped body. Uh, yeah. Strange coincidence. That is wild. That is yes. wild. If you look at all of his TV work, it's insane. I mean, I know we say that a lot. See, I remember him, I know it's going to come up, as being like the other guy in one of those, like, um, Beastmaster or something. I know he was in one well, of those, and I just can't think of... <laughs> I knew you'd know. He played Conan's father in Conan the Barbarian. That's it. That is it. <laughs> that is so it. With some big old crepe hair and like a crepe mm-hmm. beard or a crepe uh, giant mustache. Actually, him. It might have been his mustache. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that just out there? Oh, and awesome. And since you're going to bring it up anyway, yes, he was in one episode of The Master. Perfect. <laughs> yep. Your new favorite guy. That sounds just right. I immediately looked for my guy, too, uh, just because they are basically in the same. Uh, my guy's a little bit older than him, but uh, definitely in the same circles. Awesome. And yes, they are in a TV show together. Like BJ and the Bear? Man. And, and is BJ and the Bear, does he go into the the Drifter type TV like, series? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Wasn't he going from town to town solving yeah. crimes or something? Or? Sure. I mean, it's the same. Yeah. So, William Smith, 275 credits. He was in The Outsiders. Mm-hmm. He was in Rumblefish. Oh, man, that's a good movie. I love that movie. But for TV, we got T.J. Hooker, Hardcastle McCormick. All the regulars are here. Scarecrow and Mrs. King, Riptide, uh, Simon and Simon, Airwolf, Twilight Zone, Murder, She Wrote. He was in a movie next to Gary Busey, Eye of the Tiger. Hey, I might have brought this up, but what if Simon and Simon kissed and when they broke away, they each had the (laughs) other one's mustache? You have said this before. It was probably 30 episodes ago. (laughs) Good times. Talking into a void. Hell Comes to Frogtown, Maniac Cop, Evil Alter in 1988. But there's a lot of these movies that he shows up in that that really he's the only actor. Mm-hmm. I clicked on this evil altar before and it reads, In the small town of Red Rock, a devil-worshipping cult in league with the local sheriff kidnaps victims for sacrifice. Cool. I'm in. Starring Robbie Benson. How about Robert Zadar? Oh, yeah. I'll take a Robert Zadar any day. <laughs> Over Robbie Benson? <laughs> Wait a minute. You're saying, and he was in Maniac Cop also with Robert Zadar? Yes. Man, we came real close to doing a Canadian movie uh, this next week. Uh-oh. He is in Fast Company, which is one of uh, David Cronenberg's first movies. Oh, awesome. Yeah, he's the main character i didn't realize that i've seen that movie but i that's been a long time ago what year was that uh 70 oh 79 1979 he played lucky lonnie lucky man johnson yeah hey john saxon's in that film (laughs) yep as phil hey phil phil john saxon does definitely does not look like a phil nope never ever he sure does look like a john saxon though he nailed that name. <laughs> yeah. 
I I've got to for just a second talk about the Ultimate Warrior. Okay. I don't know if I've brought this up before. It no. is kind of a dystopian future uh, along the same lines as like Damnation Alley. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got Yul Brenner as the main character and William Smith is in it as Carrot. <laughs> um, <laughs> what year is that? 75. 75. It is not good, <laughs> no. but I do like certain elements of it. If you described it to somebody, it really sounds like a um, anime. Okay. And it kind of plays out as an anime, like different bosses they have to fight and stuff. But So this isn't about the WWE wrestler? <laughs> the guy that just like put steroids in every <laughs> every square inch of his body. Yeah, Max von Sydow as Baron. Yeah. You didn't mention Stephen McHattie down there. Speaking of craggy faces, mm-hmm. you know, when you click on his IMDb, that first image is of him recently with a cardigan that I think I own. Um, <laughs> well, did you contact him to see if he can get it back? No, no, no. I okay. wouldn't do I It's I his now. Doing that. <laughs> he looks real odd without that mustache. Yep, you're he right. He looks fairly normal. He looks like it. a Richard Crenna. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Boy. <laughs> Crags on that face. <laughs> so William Smith. William Smith. He was in a movie. Debbie does damnation. Oh no! A post-apocalyptic porno. It sounds like it, and it sounds like I kind of want to watch it too. Uh, Warriors of the Apocalypse. Ooh, uh, the erotic rites of Countess Dracula. I don't think I've seen that. Uh, God has a rap sheet. Oh, man. They could just name things anything. <laughs> oh, Matt Houston. There is. Debbie Does Damnation 1999. It's animated. Uh, what? Debbie goes to hell after she commits suicide. When she gets there, she finds herself in the middle of a power struggle. The devil asked her to get his horns back so that he can reign control over his realm. Yeah. Oh, well, that checks out. Yep. Sounds good to me. Debbie Does Damnation. Uh, I want to <laughs> see that. They for sure were playing off of the Debbie Does Dallas, right? Yeah, I would say so. What year is that? 1999. Oh, that's too recent. But it seems like something yeah. that uh, that uh, Ralph Bakshi, you know, the guy that did like uh-huh. Wizards and seems like something he would do, like a dirty cartoon, you know, kind of. <laughs> dirty. But there is no photo. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. Not even a plot. I think they probably did like a pilot. And they're like, oh, no, Maybe. that's no, this is stinky. I passed it a second ago here. 1994, he was in a movie called Manosaurus. <laughs> OK, <laughs> another thing that has uh, no plot. It does have a poster. The poster doesn't look half bad. It has Vernon Wells in it. Oh, man. Talk about Vernon Wells and William Smith together. Jesus. Ooh, a lot of face. A little of Vernon Wells' face goes a long way. Mm -hmm. You know, you can really spread that out over... (laughs) Toast. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of... (laughs) Use use William Smith's face as a knife. Well, we brought this up before about the Rollerblade 7. Mm -hmm. And it looks like William Smith has played in every one of these Rollerblade movies. (laughs) So Legend of the Rollerblade 7... Return of the Rollerblade 7. Oh, my God, dude. Uh, 1991. Yeah, he's Pharaoh. Is is he in Rollerblades? And why have I not watched this? I have no words for what I'm looking at right now. It basically looks like kind of a Power Rangers situation. What yes. is going on? I'm getting this. I'm finding this immediately. We've talked about it before. It looks so bad. Oh, I think we talked about it because it's the same dude that did a roller gator, right? Exactly. (laughs) They both have a lesser talented star's brother in them. They (laughs) each have Joe Estevez and Frank Stallone. That's right. Do you think that those guys get together like Frank Stallone, Joe Estevez, uh, fucking um, Clint Howard... Swayze's brother. 
I think you're right because I'm bringing up Clint Howard right now. In 1989, William Smith had a movie called Born. Okay. B O R N, which stands for Body Organ Replacement <laughs> Network. Of course it does. It was also, I guess, called Merchants of Death. Yep. And this was produced by Troma. Yep. And is written and directed by Ross oh, Hagen. Oh, man. Uh, but it has PJ Souls, see that. William Smith, Russ Tamlin, Clint Howard, Rance Howard. Yep. <laughs> I love it. I love Russ Tamlin. I know I have said this before, guys, but you really need to watch his like dance scene in, um, I think it's Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. It is mm-hmm. amazing. Absolutely amazing. Can you find that and isolate it? And Oh, it's on YouTube as just the dance scene. Is it looped so you can watch three hours of it constantly? I would. I don't know <laughs> if I could do three hours, but I would watch it like back to back. Man, in Born, Clint Howard's beard to hair ratio. <laughs> it's almost like he's wearing a... Like a hair visor that he has, like, put the top back on. (laughs) It's It kind of looks like when you've got Peter Weller as RoboCop, you know? Yes. And you've got that that flesh face. Yes. But the rest of it's not flesh. Yeah, it's just, like, stapled to his skull. (laughs) That's it. That's exactly it. That is hilarious. Uh, William Smith plays Dr. Farley in that. Farley, Farley, Farley. (laughs) Uh, yeah, Ross Hagen is absolutely loathsome. I, I hate <laughs> yes. him in everything he's in. Uh, you have brought this up before. Oh, God. Well, he's he's in a really famous MST called uh, Side Hackers. Tell us more about no, this MST. I Look, it's just a show I like, but... <laughs> That's constantly on in the background, and you're going to get a piece of it. Sure. All right, well, let's get on to William Smith's trivia, because this shit seems unreal. Besides the 5,100 freaking sit-ups, yep. Lifetime Achievement Award for the Academy of Bodybuilding and Fitness, a two-time arm wrestling champion at the 200-pound weight class. I would not want to arm wrestle that guy. Mm-mm. Uh, he was the Marlboro Man in the final televised Marlboro commercial. Yeah, I can see that. Competed as a downhill skier in the AAU events at Mammoth Mountain. Competed in motocross events with Steve McQueen and doubled as one of the racetrack riders in CC and Company. Okay. Had a 31-1 and record as an amateur boxer. Held the Air Force Light Heavyweight Weightlifting Championship, played semi pro football, won a Muscle Beach contest for performing 35 inverted handstand dips. I was like, is this even possible for one person to do? I cut my arm once and I had to get stitches. That's about the only, <laughs> <laughs> the toughest thing that I, this dude is literally like the Terminator. Yes, he studied Kung Fu for eight years with Jimmy Wu and Kempo Karate Master Ed Parker. Wow. It's unbelievable. Wow. Worked as a lifeguard on the French Riviera. Damn, dude. This guy had a stick that he had to carry around with him just to <laughs> beat the P word off. Of. I'm not going to say it. We're, this is not that kind of podcast, but. Uh, threw the discus 151 feet at a time when the top distance was 150.6 feet. Then ran and got it and brought it back in 2.3 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> the fastest ever discus fetch. His favorite writer is <laughs> Dostoevsky, too. I see, yeah. So yeah. he's like a thinking man's killing machine. <laughs> Damn, dude. Now my guy, which I thought could, you know, just like <laughs> headbutt a cinder block wall down. It's funny that you're doing this guy because mine is uh, very similar, but for, but slightly older than this guy. 
So it says here in his bio, he first came to the screen as a child actor in such films as Going My Way in 1944 and The Song of Bernadette 1943 before entering the service during the Korean War. There, his fluency in five languages what? landed him in the NSA. <laughs> okay, now I believed all that other stuff. Now I don't know. Can anyone verify this? <laughs> Please. Unbelievable. Unfucking believable. Oh, and he killed Osama bin Laden oh. with a knife. <laughs> sharpened another guy into a point (laughs) um where is oh yeah militarywiki.org william smith actor sorry i just i have to yeah you think going to wikipedia is going to verify anything that's a lot of reading that i don't want to do Uh uh-huh he was in two uh black exploitation movies with fred williamson Hey, all right. Oh, I read that earlier because it's got a bad word in the title. Oh, so it's from the yeah, 70s. I looked at that too. You could do that back then. You just ask Fred Ooh, Williamson, yes, can we put the N word in the name of this movie? And he's like, I don't care. Yeah, dude, that's he's the fucking real deal. It also says he's probably best known for his portrayal as Falconetti in Rich Man, Poor Man. Do you, do you remember mm-hmm. that, Rich Man, Poor Man? No. This guy, real deal, William Smith, born in 1933. He's probably still kicking somebody's ass. Yeah. Yeah. He is 87 years old. Wow, dude. Unbelievable. He's the fucking real deal. I wonder if he's ever killed anyone while he's been skiing. With his uh, ski pole? Yeah, ski pole. Unbelievable career. William Smith, welcome to the moratorium. Yes. (laughs) The fabled moratorium. Yeah, man. Good one. God damn. Makes me feel like a soft little baby that needs my (laughs) die-die changed. (laughs) The guy was like, and he slept in a tree for five years. And I mean, like, just (laughs) just to see if he could do it. Great career. I think I have to remember that there's like a time before the internet. (laughs) as like everything that we do as our bodies just... Turn to mush. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're all just doughy man babies compared to that dude. I started doing exercises when I was watching our yeah. movies. Not necessarily just to keep awake, but to actually get some <laughs> okay to keep fitness. awake. Right? How did you do? Are you are you sore today? Or? Two reps. I got I got two reps down. I'm good. Cool. Man, two reps of three. <laughs> they tell you to go for the burn. I don't know. William Smith. William Smith, you're one of the good Thank ones. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. They probably would just fucking drop him behind enemy lines and he would just fucking like <laughs> like killer cane and I got and this. Bigger. Yeah. Keep my lunch warm. Okay, very good. Well, that is uh like I said, synchronicities. The guy that I want to do is very very similar to the guy that you just uh covered, but let's take a little break before we get to him. All I've right. been drinking too much coffee. Okay. Hey, Freaksters and Freakettes. It's Tim from the Moratorium. Do you like the sweet sounds of our witty banter in your ears every week? Well, head on over to our Patreon, and for only $3 a month, you can get even more. In the director's cuts of our movie episodes... On average, that's 20 minutes more of our wise-cracking, jive-talking, and lip-flapping laughter straight to your ear holes. Go to themoratorium.com and click on our Patreon link, and you'll find five awesome tiers with tons of goodies. You can also find our Teespring link on the website for even more awesome merch. Thank you for your support. Now on with the show. So... As I said, this is going to be a, another craggy-faced badass. Mm-hmm. On his IMDb, it has his birth name as... Uh, now, I've seen, it, I've seen it spelled two different ways. I've okay. seen it as Vladimir, 
But mm-hmm. on IMDb, it really helps you get into like the uh, Slavic uh, like pronunciation of it. It says Volodymyr. Uh, <laughs> Vladimir Poluniak uh, was his birth name, which he later changed to Jack Palance. Jack Palance. If there is anyone, <laughs> I mean. I mean, even younger people, well, slightly younger people, know him from doing fucking one-arm push-ups at the Oscars when he was in his 70s. Yeah. He is six foot three. Oh, man, I did not know he was that tall. He's an imposing figure. Born in Pennsylvania in 1919. I can't imagine that he was ever a child. I just imagine a small Jack (laughs) Palance that just got bigger over time. And I'm going to read pretty much like verbatim from the from his bio on IMDb because it's just it's pretty good. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but it says. Uh, yeah, because it, it looks like a book. Yeah, it's pretty long. <laughs> Jack Palance quite often exemplified evil incarnate on film. No. I like that. <laughs> uh, portraying some of the most intensely feral villains witnessed in the 1950s Westerns and melodrama, which. Yeah. Changed his name to from Volodymyr to Walter Jack Palance. His dad was a coal miner, died of black lung. Great. Mm-hmm. The kids had a great time. Uh, Palance worked in the mines. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but he said, but averted the same fate as his father. He just got mild black lung. Well, that explains <laughs> the voice. Uh, his. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, and I assume that all of these guys uh, smoked a carton of cigarettes a day because um, Mm -hmm. they were told that it was good for them. Right. It took care of black lung. That's (laughs) what they said. You know what? (laughs) Exactly. It's like the. (laughs) It counteracted the effects of breathing black smoke underground. Yes. Push out that black stuff with this thick (laughs) white smoke. (laughs) Jesus. So, yeah, he got the fuck out of there um, by, oh, won a football scholarship and went to school at the University of North Carolina. Okay. Uh, He was a boxer, uh, fought under the name Jack Brazo. Brazo. That must mean something weird to him. (laughs) Uh, Or it was just like a a cleaner for like uh, your silverware and stuff. (laughs) Won his first 15 fights, 12 by knockout. That's awesome. So, of course, when World War II started, he was like, I'm going to go shoot some fucking Nazis. Um, (laughs) He was in the Air Force as a bomber pilot. He was a fucking pilot. Wow. Wounded in combat, suffering severe injuries and burns. He received a Purple Heart, Good Conduct Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. Awesome. He won the entire World War II? Yeah, he won. He was the winner. Yep. Awesome. Let alone facts, kids. Yeah, I mean. (laughs) There is a winner in war. (laughs) His name is Vladimir. Exactly. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, Oh, man, Vlad. He did play uh, Dracula. Uh, but I digress. Ah. Went back to school after that to become a sports journalist. Ah, well. So, okay. <laughs> it doesn't even seem like it should fit. Worked at a radio station, um, and that's where he got into acting. Welcome. Thinking, yeah. <sighs> Welcome to the <Sorry>. smooth-talking <laughs> oh. radio styles of Vladimir Jack Palance. Brazo. Sorry, I just ran 20 miles to get here. <laughs> um, that was a good plan. Yeah. Very good. He said he was bit by the acting bug, but then subsequently bit the bud back. Yes, and ate it and killed it and swallowed <laughs> it. He was an understudy for Marlon Brando in uh, the Broadway production of A Streetcar Named Desire. Okay. 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 Um, Stella. Oh, my God. Can you imagine that? (laughs) Everybody's like, they're like, everybody needs a sucrets. The facial burns and resulting reconstructive surgery following following the crash and burn of his World War II bomber plane actually worked to his advantage. 
<laughs> Great. <laughs> oh my God. How? How did it? Well, help? I mean, you know, makes a good bad guy in a Western. Burns on your face. Oh, it says here, out of contention as a glossy romantic leading man, Palance instead became an archetype villain equipped with an imposing glare, yep. intimidating stance, and killer shark smile. It's pretty, I mean, that, that, that really uh, <laughs> describes him. <laughs> he has worked with, like, you know, some, I mean, like the big names back in the 50s. What was the other uh, Elia Kazan movie that we were just talking about? On the Waterfront. Yes, On the Waterfront. Streetcar Named Desire. Yep, 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 yep. Up until this point, I think everybody knows him as the bad guy in Shane. Mm, okay. Uh, real fucking bad guy. Whew. That's a good movie. I don't know a lot of these. Sign of the Pagan yeah. as Attila the Hun. If you go through his images on IMDb, there is a yeah. kind of like John, uh, John Wayne playing uh, Genghis Khan uh, with that ridiculous mustache. Awesome. He has one too, which is terrifying. He looks scary. I'm looking at the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah, that was, I think that was a TV movie. Kind of looks like it should be. Yeah. But also had Denholm Elliott in it. Oh, man. Love a good Den- Denholm Elliott. Were we just talking about Shadows Land? No. I thought you said it earlier. No, oh, it's no. a Michael Winter movie. Maybe I sneezed or... Okay. Uh, He was in that with uh, motherfucking Charlie Burns. <laughs> That's how I am always going to say his name from now on. He was a nice guy, quote unquote, lieutenant in the single season TV cop drama Bronk, uh, which also Bronk. had William Smith in it. Oh, shit. Yeah. The little synchronicities are really getting on my nerves at this point. <laughs> it's not that we're in tune with each other. No, 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 no. Damn no. it, Tim. You tripped over my guy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Sally Kirkland was in two episodes of Bronx. Yeah. Um, do you remember Baghdad Cafe? I've never that seen That was it. on a lot also when I was um, younger. Seen it a bunch of times. Kind of forgot that Jack Palance is in it. And he plays kind of a, it's like a kinder, gentler uh, Jack Palance, if that's at all possible. No. I was just reading the synopsis here for Bronk, Uh the TV series. Yep. The Adventures of Detective Alex Bronkov of the Ocean City, California Police Department. The Adventures. Yeah. (laughs) It doesn't seem like. (laughs) <laughs> He's being paid with taxpayer dollars. We're not paying you to go on adventures, Bronk. Solve this fucking serial killer. Dude, picture number one for the images in Bronk is William Smith with a insane wig on. I see it. Wow. Awesome. It's like an old onion. Um, What else we got? During the... 70s, he was a real, like, I mean, I think he was always a bad guy for obvious oh, reasons. Yeah. I'm looking at the Mongols. Yeah, dude. During the Mongol invasion of Poland, uh, Jack Palance uh, and his adventures. <laughs> well, his wacky adventures. <laughs> He's like Dora the Explorer. I played Ebenezer Scrooge in a Wild West version of... <laughs> of uh, All right. It was just called Ebenezer. Was that in the 90s? Ebenezer. Holy shit. Jack Palance, Ricky Schroeder. Oh. <laughs> what, more could, what more could you ask That's it. for? You just won the podcast. Yay! <laughs> We're done. We did it. He played a character named Hellman in Oklahoma Crude, yeah. 1973. Hellman. Was he heir to the mayonnaise fortune or <laughs> was he like from hell? Yes. Yeah, it's Jack Palance from hell. (laughs) That had uh, George C. Scott and Faye Dunaway. The 1974 Dracula. I think we we made fun of this before. Yes, Yes. Uh, I'm sure we did. (laughs) It does seem ridiculous when you say it out loud like that. Picture number nine of that with him snarling with the fangs. Yes. It's not working for me. Yes. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Would you think he's drunk during that or? Yeah. Drinking blood. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Tim. I was, I was Tim. trying. I, 
Stop the recording. We need to talk for a second. <laughs> really reaching. I'm looking at Black Cobra Woman. What? 1976. Eva comes to Hong Kong. <laughs> Seeing Eva perform with a snake, Judas, played by Jack Palance, Judas gets interested in her, showers her with gifts. She moves in with him and his snakes. <laughs> Things get grim. Oh, boy. Written and directed by Joe Diamato. Oh, we knew that it was going to come up. <laughs> yes. God, that guy. <laughs> Talk about loathsome. <laughs> Joe Diamato takes the cake for loathsomeness. Is that right? Man. Okay. Cake taker. He's a real cake taker. <laughs> we will talk in at, at length about Joe Diamato at some point. There was a time when I was really like collecting all of those Italian movies and uh, mm. lesser known Italian movies. And why'd you give up on it? Probably because of Joe Diamato. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's the reason. I've had enough. Here's one that we brought up before that I need to see Jack Palance and Donald Pleasance, Martin Landau <sighs> in Alone in the Dark. Yeah. That's the companion piece to uh, Without Warning. It looks like it, but it also has Erlen Van Litt in it. Erlen Van Litt. He plays Ronald Fatty Eltzer. <laughs> okay. What year was this? Uh, 1982. Erlen Van Litt. He was Dynamo in Running Man. Oh, my God. His name's Fatty. Uh, he was Grossberger and Stir Crazy. Yes. Oh We've talked God. about him before, I think. He has four credits in acting, <laughs> but he's credited with the soundtrack because he was singing in The Running Man. <laughs> he actually sang that, like, opera bullshit? I guess so. <laughs> I see, I swear we've talked about this because we were like, oh, well, yeah, he would if he, I mean, like... You know, that was his kind of gag, sort of. Man, he was six foot six and died at the age of 30 something of heart failure. Yeah. His five sticks of butter for breakfast uh, diet hmm. eventually caught up with him. Yeah, I guess uh, so. Jack Shoulder directed Alone in the Dark, if anybody's keeping yes. score at home. And Robert Shea uh, wrote the story. Robert Shea is Lynn Shea's husband. No yep. shit. No shit. Wait a minute. Brother. <laughs> oh. Okay. Brother of Lynn Shea. Woo. Saved it. Robert Shea is another deep dive for another day because we cannot possibly Ooh. fit all of that in. He wrote a lot of cool ass shit. He was the founder and CEO of New Line Cinema. Yes. Did not know yep. that. And he was the founder of Hair Club for Men. Oh, I'm also a client. <laughs> God, Jack Palance? <sighs> My friend Kirk and his brother Trent loved a movie uh, back in the day when we were in junior high called Hawk the Slayer. Mm -hmm. uh, he is Voltan in that. Mm, Voltan. You know, you couldn't find this movie back in the day. I seem to remember going to like comic book conventions with those guys and them trying to find this clamoring over that last bootleg copy of Hawk the Slayer. Yep. So uh, Jack Palance was also in Gore and Gore Part Which 2. Which we'll, we'll circle back around for both of those movies here in a second. Okay. Okay, so mid to late 80s is really where he hit his stride. He had, within a couple of years, Young Guns, Batman, 89 Batman, mm -hmm. Tango and Cash, which his name is, mm -hmm. can you pronounce his name in Tango and Cash? Yives. Ives. I, Eves. Ives. I almost want to watch the movie just to see how they say it. Yves. <laughs> Yves Parrot. That actually sounds right. Okay. Um, Don't know what Solar Crisis is. Does that ring a bell? Mm. I, I remember the uh, box art. Oh, yeah. I remember this. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a Mad Max ripoff a little bit. A huge solar flare is predicted to fry Earth. Astronauts must fly to the sun to drop a talking bomb at the right time so the flare will point 
somewhere else. Here's what the bomb said. You're going to do what now? And that was that was it. A talking bomb. The fuck does that even mean? I don't know. This has Tim yep. Matheson, Charlton Heston, Peter Boyle. Oh my god. Jack Palance. Cavalcade. Jeez. Oh, Dan Shore. Oh. And Paul Williams as Ooh. the voice of the bomb. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, do we have to oh. do this movie now? <laughs> I think we might. It's either that or up the creek, finally. Uh huh. Wow. Oh, Solar Paul crisis. Williams playing the voice of the bomb. Oh, God. Hey. I'm a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you point that flare somewhere else? <laughs> have, kind of having a solar crisis over here. Oh, my God. That is wild. Wild and wacky. He looks good, Jack Palance, in that, like, kind of steampunk. Uh, he's got, like, Dwayne Wayne glasses a little bit, you know, that flip up in the front. <laughs> yeah, I see it. <laughs> You've never seen this movie, have you? Nope. Wow. Nope. Never seen it. Peter Boyle defiling himself in this. Anyway, which culminated in uh, City Slickers in 91, okay. which he won a Oscar for, I'm pretty sure, for Best Supporting they Actor. They gave him an Oscar for that? Okay. I'm pretty sure. I think that's what initiated the uh, one-arm push-ups was... Ah. Uh, he's like, oh, yeah? <laughs> Take this, Oscar. Uh, sir, you can't smoke a cigarette on stage. <laughs> um... <sighs> Tell me that again. The only thing keeping me alive at this point. <laughs> this is keeping the black lung at bay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's just breeze right past Cops and Robertsons. Um, uh, during his struggling days, he worked as a, a short order cook, waiter, and soda jerk, lifeguard at Jones Beach, and a photographer's model. <laughs> Wow. That really paints a picture. Jack just buck ass naked on a Uh huh. Can you pose a little bit less, yeah. Jack? Can you, Can you? <laughs> your breathing is <laughs> distracting everyone. You're a hand model in this. <laughs> yeah. Why are your pants down? I like the breeze. <laughs> Once, while filming a fight scene with Burt Lancaster, Palance actually punched the unsuspecting Lancaster in the face. Lancaster responded in kind by socking Palance in the gut, <laughs> causing him to vomit. That's how we did it back in the oh, days, kid. I can't. I mean, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, everybody was, like, ready to fight and, you know, <laughs> have fucking switchblades and shit, I assume. That picture of him as Attila the Hun is insane. <laughs> it is now my background. In short, Jack Palance wouldn't want to see him in a dark alley at night. That's what we're saying here. Not even now when he's dead. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> see, he did the same thing as like um, Clint Eastwood. And the same thing as uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and... Uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, he just went to Italy for a few years and mm -hmm. was in like, boom, 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 like knocked out like eight or nine of these things. And Gore uh, happened to be one of them. Awesome. Very iconic cover for this. I always saw it, always noticed it at the video store, uh, but I was a pretty discerning customer you know i i i took stock of the whole thing and i was like okay You're like, kid you've been here for four <laughs> hours would you please get something and all this time you were just waiting for whoopee boys to come back in yep. stock right i was hoping that they were like i know they rented it out today but they rented it out like early today so they might bring it back and get something else but they never did yeah, so he knocked out a few of these uh, Italian, what do you call, they are sword and, I guess they're basically sword and sorcery. Sword and sandal. But they're also yeah. a sci-fi element too, so right. just all of that. Um, okay. Do you remember watching Gore or Gore Part well, 2? I do, mostly because Gore Part 2, or Outlaw of Gore, as I know it, uh, uh, was a MST, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, 
and not necessarily playing in the background? No, but I can. Okay. Were you leading me with that question? <laughs> Maybe. I turned around and I just saw Mitchell uh, jumping over the fence at uh, Walter Deeney's house. So <laughs> anyway. Okay. So Gore, this first one, I didn't realize that I wanted to talk about it until I saw the people that are in it. Uh, Oliver Reed is in it. I saw Rick Marks and I thought it was Richard Marks. Yeah. I got excited for <laughs> I a did second. the same thing. <laughs> there is a Playboy playmate named Rebecca Ferrati. She gets second billing. Hmm. I drove a Ferrati mm-hmm. once. I didn't care for it. I had a uh, Ferrati for breakfast, you know, where they kind of like it. It's like a thin <laughs> omelet, but it's got like, you know, sausage, onion. Um, Paul L. Smith is in that original gore. Uh, he is a truly loathsome man who you will know from. He played the Beast Rabon in Dune. He's the guy that's like okay. cutting a piece yeah. of whatever off of that meat thing that's just kind of hanging there. Um, he's also kind of the mute um, bodyguard, I guess, for Ernie Rice okay. Jr. in uh, Red Sonia. Oh, nice. You know Ernie nice. Rice Jr.? Uh, or Ray's Jr.? I'm not sure how to say that. What was his big movie? It wasn't Three Ninjas. He had his own... That's, that's close. Yeah, something like that. Wasn't sidekicks or no? Mm, that, was, that was the kid yeah. that killed himself from Sequest. Did he really? Okay. Now I said it. Oh. I just watched the uh, Soleil Moon Fry uh, documentary. <laughs> she that has her own documentary. Not a joke. I just watched it. Oh, wow. It was very interesting. Uh, no, Mako was in uh, Sidekicks. Okay. okay, good. Well, who's the kid? Who is the well, kid? Well, I thought Jonathan Ban- Brandis. Yeah. He killed himself? Yeah, I think he committed suicide. I wonder what happened to him. When Sequest was canceled? He performed in uh, 85 commercials? Dang, man. He was also... I don't think Sequest was his... He was a child star like before that, and I can't remember what. Considered Roy Scheider to be a person of the biggest influence on him as an actor. That's a weird way to say that. Hmm. <laughs> Who is the guy in the robe? In Sequest. Mm, I don't know. I've never watched that show. I, I think I've seen it a couple of times. Was it on Sci-Fi Channel? I guess I didn't even realize that Roy Scheider was in Yeah, this. he's like the main character. I didn't realize that Ted Raimi was yep. in this. There's also a lesser DeLuise. Uh, there's two DeLuises really? in there. Peter and Michael. Oh, Jonathan Brandis is also the kid in Never Ending Story 2. Right. Uh, he also played Bill Denbro, uh, the kid version, mm-hmm. in It. Oh, yeah, and he was in Ladybugs. Yeah. Oh, my God. If you saw that Rodney Dangerfield was your daughter's soccer coach, <laughs> yeah. it would move uh, three towns away. Run. Uh, he was in The Stepfather Part 2. I watched that just recently. Mm. That was uh, Meg Foster, I believe, wasn't it? That uh, was the Let's woman. Let's take a look. Yeah. Still Terry O'Quinn, yep. Meg Foster, Carolyn Williams, who was um, Stretch in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Oh, nice. I'm sorry. How did we get on him, by the way? I have no idea. Gore? <laughs> I don't know. Was it, was it Gore? I don't know how I we got there. I don't know. God knows. But look at Larry Taylor in Gore, his picture. <laughs> Is that a makeup or is that just how he looks? <laughs> I could not tell you. He's from England, so the teeth check out. But other than that. <laughs> also, the guy that played the mummy in The Mummy. Vosloo. Arnold Vosloo. Arnold Vosloo. Uh, he was in that. Isn't that weird? Yes. So are you telling us that we're doing Cops and Robertsons next week? No, I told you already. Uh, this is all pointless. We're doing uh, Up the Creek. Okay. So, like I I like to do with these uh, yarn walls, I want to get it over quickly. You know? I want to just okay. cut right to the chase. So, I've only got two moves. All right. Well, you want to go to it now, or do you want to go into our listener request? Let's do the listener request real quick. Put a pin Let's in get it over with. Outlaw of Gore, and we'll be back right after this. After these messages. 
Have you tried smoking? <laughs> Jack Palance. Lucky <laughs> strikes. Lucky strikes. When filters are just filters. <laughs> Jack, this is a this is a <laughs> Maylox commercial. Try our new Lucky okay. Strikes. Smokable Pepto Bismol. <laughs> It's smokable. <laughs> All right. Well, coming straight from our listener requests, and we will respond to you anyway. If you want to come in and <laughs> don't dare us to watch Please. a movie, but can I say the listener? I mean, I know other people listen to it, but he's <laughs> literally the only one that has ever responded to us, correct? No, no. We've had other responses okay, okay. before, but this one decided that we should watch. Nothing but trouble. Yes. Thank you, Matt Purcell. Yes, I'm calling you out right now. Matt Purcell. If that's your real name. <laughs> asked if we could watch 1991 Nothing But Trouble. <sighs> the Dan Aykroyd starred, direct, and I think Dan Aykroyd wrote this oh, as well. Oh, yeah. With his son, Peter? I assume with a Scarface mountain of cocaine to fuel this <laughs> entire thing. This is one of my least favorite movies of all time. Oh, really? Which sucks because I love all of these people, you know? I mean... Well, most. Most. Taylor Negron. <laughs> he was probably the best part of the film. Totally agree. Can you pronounce yeah. his name, his character's name? It was Fausto. Yes, but... His last name? Yeah, no. they have last names, and <laughs> I tried it, and I was like, no. Nope. Squirinizu. Oh, that sounded I pretty don't. good. Squir Squirinizu. Where were they from? Anyway? They're Him from and Brazil. His sister. Ah, from Brazil. I remember this. They wanted to go with Chevy Chase's character. You know what? Never mind. I'm not even going to. <laughs> Are we going to get into the plot of this? That is there a plot? There's the here's what it reads. A businessman and his friends are captured by a sadistic judge and his equally odd family in the backwoods of a bizarre mansion. So if you haven't seen Nothing But Trouble, I'll put a link up to our website. There is a, a bad copy on uh, YouTube, I believe I watched, but it could be fun. Yeah. It had potential yes. and a maybe miscast. Yeah. Chevy Chase, there are so many of these movies that he just phones in. He doesn't even act like he's. And this seemed like it. Oh, he was very upset that he was in this movie. But, I mean, I you know, everybody's heard that he's just kind of like classically uh, just an asshole, you know? Classic ass. He's a real classic ass. There's a lot of trivia on this movie that <laughs> it failed horribly at the box office. Yes, as a major flop. The film only made approximately $8.5 million at the box office. The budget was estimated at $40 million. Yeah. I've looked into this movie before. I can't remember exactly where, but like all of the special effects in it are practical. Mm -hmm. Like how the house like transforms and like that bedroom that kind of flips around like in Murder okay, by Death. Yeah, yeah. That shit fucking stacks up, you know, when everything is, uh, you know. Yeah, a physical joke. I mean, did they build the little uh, roller coaster that led yes. into... The bone stripper? Uh, probably, the, yeah, the bone stripper. Is that what it was? Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that shit is great. Uh, all that, like, Rube Goldberg type uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. But, okay, John Candy... Yes. Is in a dress twice in this, I think. And gets married. Yeah. <laughs> Chevy. To Chevy Chase. <laughs> yeah, he does. He certainly does. I don't know how much you want to talk about it. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't I'm... know either. It's silly. Yeah. It's got a couple of good jokes. Yeah. It's disturbing. Very disturbing. One little pinch more. And it would be a horror movie. Yes. You know, it feels like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 a little bit. Correct. It very much does. And 
I think the Chevy Chase comedy, which was just being himself and probably was mostly ad libbed on the set. That's yes. what I can assume. It's his normal bad jokes that are yep. totally off the wall, but one liners. Yep. That's all he has in the film is just one liners. Yep. He says like fork you. I think there's like a fork in the road and he says fork you. I mean, it's that mm-hmm. level of, uh, I probably would have loved this film had I watched it when I was in third grade. Yes, it's very gross. Um, Dan Aykroyd plays a judge that is in heavy makeup. He's kind of the antagonist, and he's got a dick nose. I don't know any other way to say it, but his nose looks... Dick nose. Exactly like a dick. Yes. It has a little, like, pee hole, like a little urethra. Not only does Judge bring in, you know, these four and hold them hostage, basically. Yeah. Just so Chevy Chase could marry his daughter, right. which is John Candy and Drag. Yes. But then we have several other people that are coming through this judge's territory being pulled over yes. and taken straight to the judge. Uh, it, it's a joke because, you know, they hide his nose at the beginning, but then everybody starts laughing at it, which is also kind of weird when at near the end they had, I guess they pulled over a hearse that had an entire oh, band. Yeah, Digital Underground with Tupac. And Humpty Hump, who has a fake nose or yes. no nose or what's under that nose. I don't know. I There's a story, but I don't want to. Let's, okay. let's not drag this out. Does it involve cocaine? Maybe. <laughs> okay. The physical gags were kind of fun. You know, it, it it's a home alone setting. Yeah. There's traps everywhere. A slide that goes on forever. Yeah. There are two. Oh, God. I knew you were going to. Giant. I don't even know what they are. I don't either. They're supposed to be the judge's kids, but Ugh. they're twin blobs just wearing diapers and one of them is played by dan Aykroyd. yeah the other one is some guy that they duped into being in makeup that poor guy uh in the trivia here it states uh, it was based on dan Aykroyd's (laughs) personal experiences in 1978 when he did a buttload of cocaine and had a fever dream. Oh, I'm sorry. I read into that. Yeah, you were <laughs> yeah, editorializing there. <laughs> <laughs> he was pulled over for speeding at a rural town in northern, in the northern United States. He's not even going to name where it was. Oh. The police officer took him to the local justice of the peace in the middle of the night for a trial. So he had this idea for this yeah. screenplay, and I think it got, it got out of hand. Uh, yeah. Cocaine will do that. The film was originally darker and a tad more graphic. What? However, when the test audiences reacted poorly, the film was re-edited, and its release date was pushed back. Ugh. Did they test him again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they have PTSD after that. Aykroyd later agreed to play the giant adult baby Bobo mm. after no one else wanted to play the part. Yeah, that, that <laughs> checks out. They knew better. Yeah. Like, uh, uh-uh. But uh-uh. cinematography by Dean Cundy. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it was well shot. Yes. He pops up in so many movies. I mean, he's done so many amazing movies. Several John Carpenter movies. And it actually, the movie looks good. It's just all the stuff that happens when people start <laughs> acting. Dan Aykroyd kills a bald one, which I guess could be a pl- on the plus side of that. Okay. So anyway, nothing but trouble. I mean, I we don't need to go into great detail because a lot of people have already covered this. Yep. Uh, some other better podcasts had covered this. I would almost say that I like Spies Like Us more than this movie. You know, maybe I should go revisit that <laughs> because I don't remember enjoying Spies Like Us. Ooh, it's a slog. It's another really <laughs> like lost money, I assume. All I remember is the zero G kind of thing where they're. Smiles oh, are like right, glued right, on their yes. face. Mm-hmm. Anyway. That was the funniest part. Yep. Uh, it says 
Bertilla Damas and Taylor Negron, they're playing brothers and sisters in the film, mm-hmm. spent a lot of time with one another during pre-production rehearsing their building of characters as they portrayed brother and sister in the film. In fact, they wrote much of their dialogue with Dan Aykroyd's approval. And that's what I think came apart with a lot of this. I mean, just like Chevy Chase, I think he did the same thing. Would just ad lib ad lib the entire thing. Not a great And that's idea. probably what Taylor Negron did as well. They just ad libbed and said, uh, that's funny, let's keep this. <sighs> it it didn't work for me. No. Dan Aykroyd offered the script to John Hughes who was interested in the story, but ultimately turned it down because he only directed his own scripts. Wise. That was a great excuse. I could use that. (laughs) Uh, John Landis disliked the script and immediately turned it down. Yeah. He knows a turd when he smells one. (laughs) Yeah. Smart moves. Wow. Well, to our listener, good job. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for making me watch this film. I don't remember watching this all the way through. I was probably a much smarter person back then. Yeah. But I watched it all the way through in in about six different settings. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I feel like the same thing for me. Like, I'd watch it in bits and pieces as it came on, like, cable TV and stuff. Okay, well, I think that is... I think we've said all there is to say about that, probably. Yep. Wiener knows John Candy in a dress. And maybe Dan Aykroyd eating. Oh, God, dude. Eating I mean, hot in dogs. this movie, he is eating like a giant hot dog covered in sloshy uh, condiments. When I think of that movie, that's what I think of. And it makes me that's sick it? to my stomach. Yes. Is it that any movie that has Dan Aykroyd eating bothers you? Yes. <laughs> so far. Okay. I mean, two of the big ones, you know. Eating salmon through a dirty Santa beard is probably the <laughs> number one. Ugh, God. Thanks, Dan, you psycho. Thanks, uh, Matt Purcell, for making me watch this film and talk about it for too long. Thanks, Matt, you turd. All right, well, let's get on with this yarn wall and uh, wrap this bitch up. All right, we're real close. So, all right. as I said, I like to be uh, concise with my... Uh, thorough kevin bacon game also uh i think i might have brought it up at the very beginning but um we don't call it the kevin bacon game but um informally that's how we choose these movies right yeah um i think that we should replace kevin bacon with jack palance because he has been a uh through way for a couple of movies for me Oh, yeah. When we did uh, Without Warning, what did I go to from that? Um, oh, if we only had memories. I uh, I do remember using him to get to uh-huh. edit all this out and then come back in with like something, <laughs> yeah, whatever it was. Uh, but anyway, so I think we should change it from the Kevin Bacon, you know, uh, Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon to... Jack Palance being the central figure. Now, I have a couple of names that I want to run by you. Okay. 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 Jack's back, which I wasn't thrilled about. Mm -hmm. I tried to rhyme some, uh, rhyme Palance. Turns out it's kind of hard to do, except uh, (laughs) I came up with one that sounds like it's a, uh, like Fox News show, The Palance Balance, which I kind of like. Ooh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But then they get a little weirder, um, Jacking it with Jack Palance, um, <laughs> jacking around, uh, jacking around the world. All of that sounds like uh, expensive. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you usually have to pay a higher price. You have to pay a premium for jacking it around the world. Yeah, I'm just putting that out. That's there. definitely a uh, Patreon <laughs> exclusive. You don't know Jack, which I kind of liked. I don't know. We okay, can we can yeah. play around with it, but I like it that we're going to have our own game. Okay. Literally, like, you cannot swing a cat and and not hit a Jack Palance movie. <laughs> um, oh, I also thought about Wacko Jacko, because that's what they used oh, to call Michael Jackson. Okay, yeah. And I thought about Jack Palance, like, dangling a baby out of a hotel window, <laughs> you know, <laughs> blanket or whatever. That kept you busy for about seven minutes. Yep. And... So anyway. 
All right. I, I dig that. I just think we should call it uh, maybe the palance balance. I, I, that uh, sounds the best to me, but we can, we can play around with it. All right. So Rod Steiger, who also okay. you can link to anything, apparently. As we read in his trivia, which we know that trivia doesn't lie. Correct. Ooh. Everything on IMDb is canon as far as we're concerned. <laughs> so it's killing me that I can't think of what that other movie was because I did the same thing. I typed in mm-hmm. an actor with Jack Palance and Googled that. And and of course, a movie popped up. <laughs> Rod Steiger and Jack Palance were in a movie called The Big Knife together. Wait, The Big The knife? Big Knife. Wow, how long ago was that? This is pre-Crocodile Dundee, so he wasn't there to say, that's not a knife. Remember that movie? (laughs) Thanks. So we're not going to spend any time on the big knife. I think it was black and white, probably. Oh, are you not going through that? No, 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 no. just trying to find We don't have time. You were just trying to say that, okay, that they were in the same movie. They were in a movie together. together. Guys, check it out if you don't believe me. The big knife was 1955. Also, it had Ida Lupino. Struther Martin. Shelley Winters. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, he does look like Dracula in that. Like, his hair is very dark, and it comes to, like, a widow's peak. So, from Jack Palance, uh, he's the bad guy in Gore. He's the bad guy in the original Gore, and I think he's in the mm-hmm. uh, the sequel, too. He plays Xenos. Xenos. And you want to see somebody like... I am just doing this movie so I can like add another wing onto my house or buy a boat mm. or something like that. <laughs> he, he was phoning it in. But anyway, but if you look at Gore from Rod Steiger to Jack Palance and the big that knife one movie, we just said the big knife from Jack Palance to Urbano Barberini, the titular care. Oh no, it isn't. He isn't called Gore. That's the name of the, planet i guess who fucking knows a uh, vinnie barbarino is the name of the planet yep and uh freddie boom boom washington was in there too <laughs> he was a neighboring <laughs> son yes <Right>? yes <laughs> anyway urbano barbarini is in one of my favorite italian horror movies of all time demons all right a lamberto bava joint dario argento produced yep some say that it was kind of a uh, poltergeist et situation where Mm -hmm. i think we'll get way more in depth into this but i think lamberto bava was uh dario argento was kind of his uh mentor a little bit and i also believe that lamberto i think his father is mario bava We'll get more. We'll that. get. We'll we'll talk about all that bullshit later. But um, great movie, so gory, so scary. Um, it is just a real, uh, yeah, a real moratorium movie because I found this and I was like, holy shit! This was nineteen eighty five. Prime time. That is prime time. Uh, read it off. A group of random people are invited to a screening of a mysterious movie only to find themselves trapped in the theater with ravenous demons. Ravenous demons. The plot of this is also just fucking great. Uh, all of these people uh, get this kind of mysterious uh, you know, ticket. I've got a golden ticket. Exactly, but... I'm going to walk right in to end my life. Yep. That was beautiful, Tim. Oh, thank you. I did not know that you could sing. La, 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 la. I still don't know that you can. <laughs> uh, anyway, called Demoni in Italian. Demoni. Cool. Oh, yeah, like Count Demoni in uh, uh. <laughs> what was that? Uh, History of the World. Well, that was a song, right? Demone Moan. Oh, no, hey, man. Hey. Uh, I'm going to punch myself. No, 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 no. Uh, there is a Billy Idol. Uh, they play um, White Wedding in, in, this, in the soundtrack for this movie. All right. Well, not so bad. Also, the soundtrack has, uh, I think Goblin does a lot of uh, the music, which is uh, Dario Argento's band. All right. Man. 
I would love to get the uh, vinyl al- album for this movie. It's got a lot of really good music in it. The composer is Claudio Simonetti. Of course it is. Simonetti, mm-hmm. who composed uh, Suspiria. Oh, man. Uh, Another he was in the music him. department for Deep Red. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Deep Red also. God, mm-hmm. that has a awesome soundtrack. And we knew we were going to get into uh, Bava and Argento soon enough. I think this comes at a great time because I'm really, I was really missing the Italians lately. They do it in such a way that is just like, puts us to shame sometimes. Also, the actors don't mind going through hell to really get the best (laughs) performing, like throwing maggots at them, barfing up all of this stuff. Do you think it's like their Screen Actors Guild? They don't have the protections? Maybe so. Right? So, so it's like, hey, you signed your name here. It says ETC at the bottom. How Whatever I want to throw at you, I can do it. 100%, I believe that. Maggots? Got them. There's no such thing as an <laughs> ASPCA to come by and say, hey, <laughs> oh, right. you just stepped on like a thousand maggots. That's not, <laughs> even though they are... Small creatures, you still can't do that. Yeah, we're way stricter in America. Yes. Anyway, has one of my favorite characters of all time, the uh, pimp who kind of like takes over. He's very, uh, very Fred Williams-esque. In fact, mm-hmm. if, I, if I found out that they wanted Fred Williamson or wrote it for Fred Williamson, I, I would not be surprised at all. Wow. It's got a real kind of Carpenter vibe, too, a little bit, because it's all one location. They're all running okay, around yeah. in this theater, this huge theater that is actually a theater in, I want to say, maybe Germany uh, okay. called the Metropolitan. I could be wrong, but we'll talk about all this next week. But anyway, there you have it. Awesome. Lots to talk about. I've already got so much to talk about, and I'm just in the writing credits. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you wanted to, we could just like daisy chain a bunch of a oh, bunch yeah. more Italian movies in here. But love it. All right. All right. That's awesome. I can't wait for next week then when we watch Demons. So gloopy. There's a lot of fluids in this movie. I know how mm, you like fluids. Loose fluids. <laughs> yes. Uncontained fluids. Oh, they're everywhere. Slimy and slurpy fluids. Slimy doesn't even begin to describe it. Well, all right, Jason, let's wrap this bitch up. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find us? Um, They can come see us at themoratorium.com. Yes. It's a website. Aren't we doing a live show like at uh, Pee Wee Park down here? Um, Yes. Yeah. Can we do that? (laughs) We do like a commentary? (laughs) To to homeless people, the only people who want to show up. Hey. They need entertainment, too. It's an audience. (laughs) Uh, You can also find us on all the social medias. Uh, We do have that growing Facebook group that I brought up earlier. Feel free to to come on in. Have a seat. We just finished our MySpace page. How does it look? Uh, It's okay. (laughs) It can use some work. (laughs) Yeah. I thought blue text on a red background would be great. It was very kind of flashy colors. It gives me a headache when I read it. So I had a seizure. And a seizure. But you guys yeah. try it out. See how you like it. If you'd like to support this podcast, please head on over to our Patreon. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep this barn burning. Yes. We're having a great time now. We're like on episode 55. I don't see a slowing down whatsoever. I have a great nope. time doing this. It's a lot of fun. Yes. It doesn't nearly take out all the time. I have seen daylight twice this week. Mm-hmm. I'm fine, guys. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> they tell you that you need like uh, like vitamin D and stuff like that and like actually get like the sun on your skin. I don't find that to be true. Mm. They tell us a lot of that. things. <laughs> yeah yeah they if you'd like to uh, pony up about three dollars a month you can get our director's cuts of our movie episodes i'm sure demons is probably going to be about four hour production 
and I'm going to cut it down to about 48 minutes. So it's going to be awesome. Yep. So you can get the director's cuts of our podcast movie episodes. If you want to give us a little bit more, I'm going to start giving out prizes here. Yes. Okay. I actually have several things. I just got those stickers in yesterday. I posted it up on social media. We've got a new moratorium sticker that's going in our goodie bags for if you give us $10 a month, I believe. You get a VHS nightlight. You get membership cards. You get stickers. The VHS nightlight is very cool. The nightlight rocks. I just got the stickers put on those. I'm going to get some pictures taken of these and throw them up on our website as well as our Patreon page so you can see what you're getting. Lots of cool stuff. Lots of giveaways. Please head on over to our Patreon and just throw us a bone. Pat us on the ass. We appreciate it. Yes. We won't go to HR about it. (laughs) We We could. could. (laughs) But we won't. Note to self, create HR department. Okay. <laughs> you and I were saying two different things. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap this bitch up. Okay. Jason, do you have anything else to I offer? I do not. I'm ready for sloppy, gloopy. Demons is like Italian, like double dare. So Ooh. there will be some slime right. references. Can't wait. I know. It's going to be great. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I think that's it. We did it. Yep, we did it. All right. Say goodnight, podcat. <laughs> he just had a whole thing of mashed potatoes. I don't think he's feeling good. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. been listening to the yarn wall an empty cornfield production join us next week when we visit the italians once again with demons unlike zombies these creatures are just trying to wreak havoc and man does it get messy you can stream demons on youtube and on shutter if you have any movie suggestions or just want to tell us how much we really suck you can contact us at moviemoratorium at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and long live VHS. Full body. <laughs> Aromatic, bombastic <laughs> acting style. Notes of leather and antifreeze. <laughs>